Well, in terms of uh, prophetic preaching, the difference between uh, a sermon and, and a lecture is about 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm delighted to uh, get to be with you today. I've loved uh, your uh, generosity and hospitality, and we've had really good food, and uh, it's been great fun for me. I'm going to talk about the Psalms tonight, and uh, as you may know, there is a move in the study of Psalms to study the book of Psalms as a canonical whole with the idea that you can't just take one psalm or another, but you have to see what this whole corpus is about, and that's sort of behind my thinking. Uh, so I have uh, begun with two questions about the psalms. First question is, why do the psalms have such a grip on us? Why do we carry the psalms into a hospital room when we make a pastoral call? Or why when somebody who grew up in the church has a stroke and they can hardly speak, what they can do is to say Psalm 23. They can get that. So it has this magnetism for us that is quite amazing. The second question I have is that if the Psalms are such a draw for us, why is it that we only know six of them? A Baptist may know a few more, but what we basically know are 1 and 8 and 23 and 46 and 103 and 22 because Jesus quoted it, but we have so many Psalms we don't use. So why is it that we cling to the Psalms and why do we so limit our use of the Psalms? Why do we have this strange love-hate relationship with the book of Psalms? And I want to suggest one answer to both questions. To both questions, the answer is that the Psalms offer a counter world that is quite unlike the presumed world in which we live. And we are drawn to the Psalms because we really want to have that counter world. We want to have a world in which God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. We want to live in a world where you can lift up your eyes to the hills and get help and all that good stuff. But on the other hand, we sort of avoid the Psalms because the counter world of the book of Psalms is very raw and very edgy and very disputatious and very emotionally conflicted and we just do not go there so we manage not to use those Psalms. I worship in the Episcopal Church and uh, we sing a Psalm every Sunday you wouldn't believe how many of them we avoid because uh, Episcopalians are really very nice people and you don't want to do any poetry that's not nice. So I want to talk about the world in which we live and then I'm going to talk about the counter world of the book of Psalms and then I'm going to talk about the God who occupies the book of Psalms. And if I hold up I'm going to do seven marks of our world, seven marks of the counter world, and seven marks of the God who occupies the book of Psalms. So if we're lucky, it'll come out to around 21. We'll see how that goes. So first of all, here are the marks of the world in which we live. You can see whether this is a, a faithful description, but I think it's a pretty good description on the night before we vote. First, that the world in which we live is a world that is anxious about scarcity. So that's what Pharaoh dreamed too, that there's not enough to go around. So we quibble about how to share health care and we quibble about how much funding to do for schools and our uh, advertising on television uh, keeps reminding us that if we don't have the right car or the right beer or the right deodorant, we really haven't arrived yet, so we are still in a deficit position. 
And we ration everything. We ration food, we ration health care, and we try or very often to ration grace so that it's only available to certain kinds of people. Second, the world in which we live because of scarcity uh, is propelled by an ideology of greed in which we believe that it is important to get more and to have more and if you have to take it away from your neighbor that's all right too. So this culture of greed requires amazing overwork and if you ask most people who of our ilk what's the big problem with their life they will tell you first of all they don't have enough time because you gotta stay electronically connected 24 7 or you might fall behind and we engage in insatiable multitasking I am hoping that Millennials will break that pattern of overwork and that is propelled by greed and needing to have more. Third, we live in a culture that prizes self-sufficiency. We really think if we're smart enough and quick enough, we can secure our existence. So Pharaoh, famously in Ezekiel 29, bragged, he said, the Nile is my own, I made it. He thought he made the Nile River. And no doubt the man in the parable in Luke 12 was propelled by self-sufficiency in which he tore down his barns to build bigger barns, to get greater surplus so that he would be secure no matter what happened to him. I was recently at a, at a college where I was talking about how God gives us all kinds of food and we rely on God's gift of food and there was a sociologist who responded who said uh, we don't really need God, we can man make tomatoes. And I didn't have the wits to say that must be why they taste so bad. <laughs> But Moses already said in the book of Deuteronomy, when you have eaten your fill and live in fine houses and your flocks and your herds and your silver and your gold is multiplied, do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Fourth, because we live in a world that really does not work very well the way we have arranged it we are very much seduced into denial in which we do not want to face up to the way in which we have organized life as a failure that is incredibly destructive we know better but we collude with each other to pretend we know that a different beer will not make us popular. We know that a drug that will sustain us for four hours does not make us better men. We know that more weapons will not make us safe. We know that the violent liturgy of the NFL is nothing but a narcotic and it's not really about anything. But we collude, we go along with the denial and we pretend. And fifth, because we engage in such denial, we eventually end, our culture eventually ends in despair. You see whether you think that's an accurate description. There are lots of healthy reasons for despair, and the most strongly felt despair now is among white tenured males who recognize that the old patterns of growth and success and security do not work anymore. So it turns out that Tom Brokaw's best generation turned out to be self-occupied narcissistic people that are not so good when, it, when the going gets rough. 
And as a result of that despair, so it seems to me, we become uncaring and is hospitable and short-tempered because we are living at the edge of our ability to cope and we do not see how it's going to get any better. And six, this is all too much. So I think we live in a world of amnesia in which there are so many things that we do not want to talk about and we do not want to remember so we do not want to have a conversation about slavery and Jim Crow and racism. We do not want to have a conversation about My Lai and Napalm and Auschwitz and Hiroshima and Chernobyl. And basically the reaction you get when you try to talk about that with very many people in our culture is that I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about the fraud that is worked in the name of capitalism. I do not want to be reminded of the ovens of Poland or the walls of Israel or Arizona. I prefer a don't ask, don't tell amnesia. You don't tell me and I won't ask you. And Moses says over and over in the book of Deuteronomy, take heed lest you forget. The outcome of all of this, so it seems to me seventh, is that we arrive at a normless world in which there are no more norms of civility or decency or neighborliness and we fall into a kind of new privatism of private security, private well-being, private meaning and private facts. Well, you can continue the list. That's my seven. And you may think that's too dark. I think that's the world in which God has put us for faith and ministry. And I do not want to minimize the fact that there are good gestures to the contrary. I know that. But my conviction is that the ideological systemic force of this way of being in the world is so powerful that it dominates everything about our common existence and our common culture and that's what has been entrusted to us. In that world, my second point is, in that world we turn to the Psalter and when you read the book of Psalms, you get a very different world. You get a world that is not dominated by this ideology of deathliness that I have tried to line out. And so we embrace the Psalter, we hear and recite, and we sing, and we sense, and we notice that we are engaged in the Psalter in an act that is deeply subversive, that the Psalter is deeply ambiguous, that it is partly eager for an alternative, that it is partly in dread for an alternative. So here is my characterization of the world you get if you live inside the Psalter. First of all, in contradiction to the world of anxious scarcity, the Psalter is an affirmation of trustful fidelity. So the 
Salter talks sometimes, Sigmund Movickel has studied about the phrase evildoers that are all around and the, the people that use the psalm speak of evildoers that will do you in, but it does not give in to evildoers. So if you take Psalm 27, for example, the threat is named. Psalm 27 talks about evil and adversaries and foes and an encamped army and enemies and false witnesses. But then it counters to say that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? For he will hide me in the shelter in his shelter in the day of trouble. And the psalm moves on to these incredible imperatives addressed to God. Hear, be gracious, do not hide, do not turn me away, do not cast me off, do not give me up. And then the psalm recognizes that it's engaged in contradiction. And, it, and so Psalm 46 goes on to say, Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble, though Habakkuk, though the fig tree, though the flock is cut off, though the fruit trees do not bear, I will exalt in the God of my salvation. This is an incredible refutation of the God of incredible anxiety. Second, the Psalter contradicts our world of greed by celebrating a world of abundance over which the Creator God presides. So in Psalm 145, the opening of the psalm, it's, it's like a, it's like a a, a semantic exercise, make a list of all the terms you can think of for God's miracles. Works, mighty deeds, majesty, wondrous works, awesome deeds, greatness, abundance, goodness, righteousness, they're all synonyms. And then it is as though whoever wrote this psalm had an assignment to write a poem using the word all as many times as you can. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upheals all who are falling, raises up all who are found down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food. You satisfy the desire of all living things. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He fills the desires of all who fears him. The Lord watches over all who love him. It is, it is this incredible comprehensiveness of all creation that is watched over. Now I should be honest to say that in Psalm 145 at verse 20 there's one other all. All the wicked he will destroy. That we usually leave that out when we sing it in my church. Because it's not nice. The wicked or the people who do not respond to God's abundance. And they won't make it. Third, in the face of self-sufficiency, the book of Psalms celebrates our ultimate dependence upon God that contradicts our self sufficiency. In Psalm 10, there is a description of the self-sufficient. All their thoughts are, says, there is no God. They think in their heart, we shall not be moved. They think in their heart, God has forgotten. He will never see us. And then it goes on to say, people who think that lurk in secret like a lion. They seize the poor. They seize the poor and drag them off in a net. 
The psalm thinks that's the ultimate outcome of self-sufficiency in which you devour vulnerable people. The last half of the psalm is the voice of the vulnerable who do not want to be and cannot be self-sufficient. Rise up, O Lord. Do not forget the oppressed. Break the arms of the wicked. Seek out the wicked until you find none. You will incline your heart. You will strengthen your heart to do justice for the orphan and the widow so that those from the earth may strike terror no more. Psalm, uh, Psalm 9 is a perfect mapping of the destructiveness of the self-sufficient and the hope of the vulnerable who are dependent. Fourth, in a world of denial, the book of Psalms is all about truth-telling. And truth-telling gets incredibly abrasive. So in Psalm 44, you see whether you think this is truth-telling, the first eight verses are a very conventional doxology about how great God is. But by the time you get to verse 9, here's a little truth-telling to God. <laughs> You have rejected us and abased us. You have turned, you have not turned back our foe. You have made us like sheep for the slaughter. You have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle. You have made taunts of the neighbors. You have made us a byword among the nations. I don't know how it is among Baptists, but in the church where I worship, after we read something like that, we say, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. And you could tell nobody's listening because, oh, thank you. Thank you for those good words. <laughs> the, the, Psalms, the Psalms are an antecedent of pastoral counseling and pastoral therapy in which they understood before Freud that truth-telling is healing. So the psalm continues, all this has come upon us, yet we have not forgotten you. We have not been false to the covenant, yet you have broken us in the haunts of jackals. And then, without explanation, the psalm issues petitions to God, arise, awake, rise up, redeem. Thank you so much. <laughs> because the Psalter believes that when life is conducted in truth-telling before God, this is a God from whom no secret need be hid. And that phrase applies not only to our sin and guilt, that phrase applies to our need and our failure and our anger and our hate and our resentment and our indignation. Fifth, against our world of despair, the book of Psalms is a world of hope, for which I cite Psalms 42 and 43. The psalmist says, My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me continually, Where's your God? When folks act, ask the psalmist, they do not say, Where is God? They say, Where is your God? Where is my God? And the psalmist will not give in. The psalmist goes back to God and says, Vindicate me, O God, and defend me and deliver me from these unjust people. Why have you cast me off? Why must I walk mournfully? Send out your light. And then the self poses a question and issues an answer. Why 
are you cast down in despair, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I will again praise him, my help and my God. That's in 42 and in 43, the same thing. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I will again praise him, my help and my God. Do not hope in self. Do not hope in progress. Do not hope in in luck. So Jesus tells this parable about the, we call her the importunate widow in Luke 18. She's a nagger. And she, in the parable, she nags and nags and nags the judge until the judge gives her justice. And Jesus says, pray like that. Pray like that. And you will never lose heart. I think that's what's going on in 42 and 43. It is a world of hope that keeps after God. And that does not lose heart. And that does not end in despair. Sixth. In the face of amnesia, the Psalter is a book of remembering. So in Psalm 105, the, these Psalms are so long that we, in my church, we only use snippets. You know what you get are snippet Christians. It's got 45 verses of the wonders of God. And it is matched in Psalm 106 that's got 47 verses of Israel's sinfulness. So Israel uses these psalms because it wants to remember every goodness of God. And Israel uses these psalms because it wants to remember every failure of covenant with God because all of that history continues to be operative and if we do not acknowledge it it will operate in subterranean and destructive ways and then comes Psalm 136 you know a Psalm 136 that the first line of every verse remembers something big that God has done in Israel. And the second line of every verse is that God's chesed endures forever. God's chesed endures forever. This is Israel's exegesis of everything that has happened in the world. Everything that happens in the world is an act of God's chesed. And I've decided that we need to translate uh, chesed as extreme solidarity. I don't think steadfast love is good enough or loving kindness. It's more intense than that. So Israel's act of remembering is to call to mind in the community that the world in which we live, if we have the wits to notice and the tongues to confess, is that God is visible everywhere working for good in this world and we don't want to forget a cubit of it. And seventh, in a world of private normlessness, the Psalter celebrates God's norms with the recognition that God's norms, God's Torah, God's commandments, God's laws, yield the conclusion that God's yoke is easy and God's burden is light. So as you know, the Psalter begins in Psalm 1, blessed are those who meditate day and night on the Torah of Yahweh. 
And Psalm 19 talks about how the Torah restores life and Psalm 119 goes on and on and on and on for what 176 verses something like that it's alphabetic eight alphas eight betas eight gimels eight dollars it's fun to wander through the alphabet with you you know that you have to be really old to remember a you're adorable B, you're so beautiful. Q, C, you're a cutie full of tars. D, you're a darling. And E, you're exciting. And F, you're a feather in my arms. And so on. Look at the whole, the whole Torah with the constant refrain. Oh, how I love your Torah that gives life. The book of Psalms is a vigorous protest against normlessness because normlessness leads to death. So my urging to you who are pastors and are going to be pastors, expand the repertoire of the Psalter and use it all. Use all of it because it is put there for our use. So my third point is that it is this God who occupies the book of Psalms and so the book of Psalms is a huge act of refusal of all of our easy idolatries. So the God of Psalms is a God of abundance. Already uh, in the flood story, the creation is guaranteed that summer and winter and cold and heat and day and night will not cease. It could be that our fossil fuel abuses of the earth will finally break the cycle of summer and winter and cold and heat and day and night, but not yet. And not soon, because God is faithful and we do not need to live in anxiety. Second, that God against greed is a God of generosity. So Psalm 104 celebrates God's incredible generosity. You cause grass to grow for cattle and wine to gladden the heart, and oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart, Psalm 104. Wine, oil, and bread, these are the tools of sacraments, bread, wine, and oil, but they are also the most elemental sustenance for daily life, and they are all gifts of God. Third, in the face of self-sufficiency, God is reliable. So in Psalm 73, there is a description of the self-sufficient guy. And the psalmist begins by noticing self-sufficient people who are so well or that vanish when the sun comes out in the morning and they leave not a trace in human history. They got no durability, they got no staying power. They don't amount to anything. So if you don't know 73, get to know it. 
the, the second half of 73 is you uphold me with your, I'm not self-sufficient, you uphold me with your right hand. I heard a Lutheran pastor say recently that she walked 600 miles in Africa to get out of the war zone and she walked with an eight-year-old eight -year little girl and she held her hand for 600 miles and when they crossed the boundary into safety she looked at her hand and it was raw from the tight grip. You hold my hand and then the psalm goes on to say, Whom have I in heaven but you, and what would I possibly desire on earth but you? This is a willing dependence that is glad to find such a faithful partner. Fourth, in the face of denial, this is the God of all truth. So Psalm 32 is one of the shrewdest pastoral psalms. Luther called it one of the Pauline psalms in which he got this uh, amazing insight about the grace of God in which the psalmist says about his denial, while I kept silent my body wasted away through all my groaning all day long. My strength was dried up like the... He got psychosomatic illness from holding it in. And then he says, But then I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not hide my iniquity. I said I will confess my... Tra I will tell the truth about me to you. And then without a punctuation mark, no comma, no pause, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave me. The psalmist discovered that the road to health and well-being with God is to break the bubble of denial that thinks we can pretend ourselves beyond the truth of our life. This was Freud's great insight and while Freud fought his Jewishness forever he had that insight because he was a Jew. Jewish faith is about dialogic transaction in truth-telling and we are the heirs of this Jewish book of truth-telling. And in the face of despair, God is everywhere the great promise keeper. I don't know whether this is the best psalm, but the one I thought of was Psalm 85, where the psalmist says, Steadfast and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. What this psalm does is to give us the whole vocabulary of faithfulness. Steadfast love, faithfulness, righteousness, peace, faithfulness again, righteousness again, righteousness third time. And then it ends by saying, God will give all that you need for prosperity and well-being in the world. God will give God will give and give and give. And I think that this sort of psalm about that celebrates God's promise keeping is God being there before Martin Luther King with I have a dream. God has these incredible dreams for the well-being of the world that completely outflanks our despair. And sixth, the world of God is a world of remembering in the face of amnesia. I thought of two texts. They're not in the, well, one's in the Psalms and one's not. But in the book of Lamentations, there is this journey into despair 
about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then right in the middle of the third lament, the, the, the psalmist, he is a psalmist, reverses field and says, but this I remember, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Memory is the ground of hope. So we live in a society of amnesia, which means that we are fated to live in a society of despair. It is the church's business to remember. I remember that God's steadfast love never ceases and his mercies never come to an end, and great is your faithfulness. Or in Psalm 103, he, with an allusion back to Genesis 2, he remembers our frame, that's the way we used to train it. He remembers how we were formed. He remembers our creation in Genesis 2. He remembers that we're dust. God has very low expectations for us. What can dust do? Never mind. And therefore he has compassion on those of us who are his creatures of dust. God has not forgotten who we are. And seventh, God is a norm giver for our good. It's too bad that the Old Testament has been caricatured by Christians as moralistic and legalistic. That's not what the Torah is about. And I think one of the things we ought to do in our New Testaments, every time you come to the word law in Paul, cross it out and write Torah. It's the, it's the commandments that are the path to life. Because God knew at Mount Sinai that we are pen ultimate and must be in sync with the ultimacy of God. And so the commandments are given for our good and for our life. So that the keynote of the psalm in Psalms in Psalm 1, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the Torah of Yahweh and on his Torah they meditate day and night. And in Psalm 1 and in many other places, the foolish, the foolish are not so. The foolish never made it to Mount Sinai. The foolish think there is no God. The foolish think that they can do what they want to. The foolish think you can devour your neighbor. The book of Psalms tells otherwise. So the book of Psalms is a script for those who reject the foolishness of the world of death. And I think that Psalm 112, and then I'll be finished, that Psalm 112 is a sketch of our best selves. Psalm 112 is a match to Psalm 111. They belong together and Psalm 111 is a catalog of the way in which God's righteousness gives life and then Psalm 112 is a characterization of what a righteous person looks like. Happy, 112, happy are those who fear the Lord and who greatly delight in his commandments they rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their heart is firm, secure in the Lord. This is a description of a person who has given her life over 
to the common good. They lend generously, they advocate justice, they share with the poor, they are not upset at evil tidings, they don't go into a panic when the market collapses, they are unflappable because they know that their life is sustained by the goodness of God. And just for a little schadenfreude, the last verse says that the evil see it and they gnash their teeth. It just makes them so mad that righteous people prosper. Wow. This book of Psalms has been entrusted to us. And we have mostly neglected it. It is terribly important that Martin Luther who is basically an exegete, got his great insight into the grace of God by studying the book of Psalms. He found the grace of God in the Psalms. And he understood that the God found in the book of Psalms is an antidote to the deathliness of the world. Our society leaves us with an itch to be overachievers, to be driven, to be compulsive, to be short on buoyancy, and to shun risk. The people who are formed by the Psalter live differently, live in joy, live with buoyancy are ready for risk. And as we go along in our growth in this literature of life, we are characteristically lost, get these three, in wonder, love, and praise. It is the truth of the book.